Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Roland. Yes, hi, good morning, <laughs> everybody. Um, and thanks for the short introduction, Christina. And yes, uh, thanks for, uh, to Republica for having us here today. Um, yes, uh, I will introduce my peers over there in a minute. But uh, let me give you a short introduction to our talk. My name is Nile Heise, by the way. I'm a digital media researcher, but I will introduce myself later. Um, you know, if you have been here the last days, you might have realized that uh, hate speech, online harassment, and all of these things are quite, yeah, uh, are issues which have been discussed a lot in several sessions and talks. And yes, actually, we could say this is the ugly face of online communication. And it is an issue, of course. And we've seen uh, in media coverage about gaming uh, communities, etc. We see extreme cases, and many times, uh, like this case by Carolyn Sinders. Um, she wrote about it last year. Um, she had uh, some users, online users, sent a SWAT team to the house of her mom. So we could say this is really an extreme case, which is rather unlikely to happen to us probably, but we cannot deny that online harassment and vicious online behavior like cyberbullying, flaming, etc., is a problem. So if you look at the research, for example, a study from Pew Research in 2014, they found that four in 10 internet users are victims of online harassment uh, in, of different types, of course. But they also found that 73% uh, of adult internet users have seen someone be harassed in some way online. A study from this year from Norton also showed that almost half of uh, female users they were asking about online harassment had actually uh, experienced online harassment and almost 80% of women under 30 had experienced kind of, uh, different forms of online harassment. So we could say that harmful behavior is actually an everyday life reality for many people. So this is uh, not a form, these are not extreme cases, but we need to find ways and also um, yeah, means or tools whatsoever to talk about these things and also to work against them. We are here today, <laughs> um, a team of four, <laughs> um, to talk about um, yeah, the, this uh, wishes online behaviors from an another angle, not so much from a regulatory perspective or law perspective, for example, but more from an ethical perspective. Um, and we chose uh, uh, the topic of online community management as one focus because of all four of us, we are working on, uh, in, from different perspectives on these issues of online communication and community management. And I'm really glad uh, to have you here. There is Kelly Boudreau, and then we have Thorsten Busch and Roland Panther. And as I said it, my name is Nila Heise. So uh, the modus operandi today is uh, <laughs> that we will give uh, uh, short presentations uh, to present something about our work, what is our perspective on ethical issues and community management, and afterwards we will hopefully have some time <laughs> for Q&A, and uh, we'd also like to learn about your, dis uh, your, uh, your perspective on, uh, on this issue. Okay, so first up, we start with Thorsten. <coughs> Thorsten um, is currently working as a visiting assistant professor at the University of Constance. He's also a lecturer at the University of St. Gallen and affiliated with Concordia in Canada. So come here. All right, ma'am. <laughs> it's your stage. The stage is yours. Merci beaucoup. Hi there. Good morning, everybody. Um, so we're, we're being audio streamed today, and people outside there see the video stream of this. So I introduce myself to the outside world um, as being a business ethicist looking like this. Could the audience please clap for just one second to signal to the audience that I do look, in fact, exactly like this. Please clap right now. Merci beaucoup. Um, that is very kind of you. 
So that is what a business ethicist looks like, right? Like, it's important to have a white beard. It signifies wisdom. It's important to have truth in your hands, right? Like the Ten Commandments. And it's important to look really fierce and mean because we like dissing people. Um, so I'm showing you this because that is kind of the job description according to, I think, a lot of people. They think business ethicists are just, you know, uh, mean, wisecracking people who bitch and moan about companies all the time. Um, that's one misconception, though, and another one is that you can expect ethicists to give you something like Campbell's condensed business ethics soup, i.e. a ready-made solution for every ethical problem you could possibly have in any given context. And so I'm, I'm very sorry to disappoint you right away, but that's not what we're going to offer. Um, because ethics is about you figuring out your own shit, not us telling you what to do. And so my job here is to sort of just frame this conversation a teeny tiny bit in terms of ethics, but not to tell you how we can fix online community management once and for all. So now, looking at this card here from the card game Munchkin that you might know, we talk about trolling here. And this is a net troll, a level 10 net troll, mind you, has no special powers and is really mad about it. Um, so the question is what to do, really, when it comes to trolling, right? And for, um, for the longest time, this is what companies did when they ran an online game or an online forum or some kind of online community, right? As long as the dollars came in, and you could sort of very conveniently put them into your ears and across your eyes and into your mouth. You didn't have to do anything, right? You didn't have to listen. You didn't have to do anything because the rationale was, well, as long as we have customers, we don't want to mess with them, right? We don't want to scare them away and tell them to behave nicer. And we don't have to because we still keep having customers, right? So there's just no need to do anything. And that went on for something like 20 years. And the past like three, four years have brought like scandal after scandal after scandal and in increasing amount of online outrage about companies not actually intervening. And so intervening now is often what they do, which then looks like this, um, which means it's a very clumsy sliding tackle very often. It's not very well thought out. And uh, you probably will get a red card for this if you do it wrong as a company. Right? So um, this is the part where I need to introduce a concept. Don't be scared. It's not very complicated. So I'm going to talk very briefly about instrumental corporate social responsibility, which is sort of a concept that you can see when companies try to justify why they're intervening. And this is not an Apple product, even though it looks like it, right? But we need to talk about corporate social responsibility first. So that's basically the idea that companies do have different responsibilities than just to print money. And you have, of course, just zero agreement within the discipline of business ethics on what that actually entails. But that's not a bug. That's a feature. So we know that somehow we need to deal with responsibility issues with businesses. We can't agree on what that actually means. But what we do agree on is that instrumental corporate social responsibility, by and large, is bullshit. Because that means you, the company running an online community, you help them out against harassment if and only if there's a financial benefit to you, right? The idea is, well, I'd really like to help you out, dear community, but like, this, there's just no financial incentive for us to do it, so we're just going to keep like, doing what we've been doing. And what you really need to sort of um, argue there is, well, don't people maybe have dignity and deserve to be treated as people and not just as customers, right? So you can use this gentleman's theories here, that's Immanuel Kant, of course, um, to argue to take community seriously because people are people and be, like, they deserve to be treated with dignity and not just as a means to an end, the means to an end being profit, right? So that is a point that I really want us to get back to in the conversation we're going to be having. Um, people deserve to be treated as people with dignity, um, just intrinsically, right? You don't need a profit motivation to help somebody out. If you, see, like, if you observe a person drowning and you say, well, I'd really like to help you out right now, it seems to me that that's the right thing to do. But you sure need to offer me an incentive for helping you out here because, you know, like my motivational structure is kind of capitalist. I can't do anything about it. Right? Then you know you're doing something wrong. And the same holds true for online community management, I think. 
um, and sort of turning that into a, a normative ideal of how to run a community, of course, you just end up being somehow confronted with discourse ethics one way or another. This is Jürgen Habermas. Everybody knows him, of course. So I just wanted to show a pretty picture. Um, but the idea there is that we actually need to install a process of involving everybody in the community in a conversation about how we want to run that community and everybody needs to have their say, right? It's not just about those ones who are the loudest having their say, it's about everybody in the community having their say. That's kind of the point of discourse ethics in a nutshell. Um, I just saved you like five semesters of time in grad school. Um, <laughs> and the point there is that you want to involve every stakeholder here, right? And very often when you read about um, online community management and online harassment, all these kinds of things, right? When you're European, you call for the state to regulate this, right? When you're American, you call for business to regulate this because you don't want Washington to be messing with things. Um, what I would like to call for is for community to be taken seriously, right? And sort of actually involve those that are affected by the harassment in the regulation and the governance of that harassment. Um, I've done a little bit of business consulting in my time, and you would be surprised at just like how many managers come to you asking, oh, Mr. Wise Business Ethics Guy, could you please tell us what to do? We have this issue with whatever, employees or some community, um, and we'd really like to figure this out, and we really want to do the right thing. And then if you ask them, well, did you ever talk to the people you're talking about here? Then they're like, no, that's not what management does, right? Um, and so it's kind of, it's kind of sad, really. But like this is not, this is literally like ethics is not rocket science. And um, but it's also really important to just involve the people that this is about, right? So that is one thing I want you to sort of remember. The other thing is tech is not neutral, right? It always comes with built-in values. And so the idea that business is neutral is just as stupid as the idea that technology is neutral. And you can see this with these gentlemen here, right, who took 10 years to finally understand that some white dudes in San Francisco who never thought that women or people of color could be harassed on their um, service, right, um, need to actually take this seriously and regulate this kind of stuff, right? But it took them forever to figure that out because they built their product with specific values and specific norms in mind, right? And the idea that somebody could be harassed via their service is just was seem, seem to be outrageous to them and just unimaginable. So the point that I want to really drive home here is that there is intrinsic moral value in community, which means if you run any kind of community, better take them seriously and take them seriously for their own sake, not because you need a financial incentive for this. And the second thing is that we can discuss later on, right? Like tech companies then are currently finally sort of coming around to the idea that they're actually allowing harm to happen and that that's bad, right? And they want to now intervene and take a do-no-harm approach to what they're doing. But doing no harm is just not enough, right? They also need to actively involve, um, get involved to um, influence the online culture that we have, which just happens to be a reflection of the offline culture we have which just happens to be sexist and racist and all kinds of unpleasant things, right? So the idea is that companies need to actually get involved and try to make a positive impact on culture. With that, I'm going to give this to Kelly. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Kelly Boudreau. I am a games lecturer um, at Brunel University London. I teach game studies uh, to game design students. And I want to talk about um, a little bit about managing the mayhem from the top. So top-down regulation um, and some of the problems with it and some of the, the things that we can do to move forward. Uh, okay. Uh, so I want to start with uh, terms of services and end-user license agreements, which is the most exciting topic on the planet. Um, but one of the things that we need to realize is that while it is a very uh, legal, uh, legally structure, it's there for a purpose uh, to protect the companies, uh, et cetera, and so forth. But you know, everybody, when they're playing a game, and my research is around game, um, game user research, uh, is the idea that it doesn't matter uh, what the content is in these uh, end-user uh, EULAs in terms of services for the player. They just want to scroll down, click that they've read, and agree uh, to get on playing their game. Uh, and, but the problem is, is that it's a legally binding contract, 
in the sense that um, you said you, you've read it, except there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of clauses in it and a lot of things that people just skip over. So one of the things to think about is how can we kind of make this a bit more accessible to the communities that are playing the games um, that you're putting out there. Um, I don't expect anyone to read this text, but it's just an example. Um, the top one is an extract from a terms of service from Club Penguin, which is an online uh, MMO for children six to 14 years old. And the bottom one is the terms of service uh, code of conduct for World of Warcraft, which is 18 and plus. But if you look at it, it is exactly the same language. Um, and so if you're expecting someone from 6 to 14 to kind of understand the differences between um, what is violent or vulgar versus um, somebody over the age of 18, um, you might want to communicate that information a bit. Um, the other thing to consider is that um, these things mean different things to different cultures. Uh, so in, in online games that cross boundaries, ge geographical and cultural boundaries, um, what is considered to be offensive might be different for different uh, communities. So it's really important to think about communicating these types of terms and services to the intended audience or the demographic of your, of your game. The other type of top-down um, regulation that I want to talk about is um, what Kendra Albert calls creative interventions. And so this was in Guild Wars 2 on their forums in 2012, if I remember correctly. And there's a link on the uh, slide if you want to read her full discussion about it. But on Guild Wars forums, you're not allowed to swear or use any offensive language. And what the designers had uh, decided to do is replace, they created a list of, of offensive words and um, put the word kitten. So anytime you would swear, it would be replaced automatically by code to say kitten. So if you said bullshit, it's bull kitten. Um, and so it kind of, through the, through the um, forums, it kind of was well received because it had the potential of diffusing uh, potentially problematic and toxic behavior through co co comedic relief. Um, but through this uh, um, cartoon, it mentions, you know, it's n this was not in the terms of service. So while it's a creative solution, it's fundamentally still a top-down solution because they never, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they never really uh, with the uh, online community to say what words are offensive to you and is kitten the best um, term to be replaced? You know, I mean, why not puppy? Because dogs are awesome too. Um, another way to do um, kind of to regulate online behavior uh, in an extreme way, again with Club Penguin, uh, is a chat. They have safe space chat rooms, which is, you can communicate, and if you're under 10 years old, you can only communicate through these drop-down menus. So they have um, special events so that they have new categories that you can choose from. This is just a generic one, so depending on who you want to talk to, what you want to say to them. But everything is confined to what the designers choose to be acceptable conversation for an age group. They do have a 10 and over chat room, or I think it's 10 to 16, which they allow a little bit more freedom, but it is still very strictly regulated. And then finally, uh, it's quite uh, not very clear on this slide, but uh, in World of Warcraft, this is a, a way to uh, regulate or create a set of digital afford technological affordances is to create different types of play opportunities. So this is one of the daily um, quests that you can choose from. On the bottom, this side, is PvE, which is player versus environment. And on the other side, you can choose to play player versus player. And what this does is it sets up an expectation of the type of behaviors um, that is afforded by the game. So if you're playing on the PvE server, you're playing against the environment. The idea is that it is cooperative, even though it's still a competitive game for resources. Um, you know, you tend to do your thing either with your group and go forward. In the PvP section, uh, you can attack each other, players can uh, enter combat with each other, and if you're doing a quest and somebody kills you, chances are you might curse at them and it kind of escalate towards a problematic uh, um, behavior. But the thing is, is that that's an affordance of 
the design. This is something that um, is something that can be regulated, and you can create the types of spaces that you want your uh, players to um, to engage in. And then finally, the last one that I want to talk about is uh, community management, which Roland will talk about in more depth uh, shortly. But the thing about community manage management and community managers is that fundamentally, it's a good step in the right direction, but in the games industry, it's still not a very respected position. It's a low-paying position. Um, it's a difficult uh, challenge. And if you want to read, or sorry, if you want to watch um, this video, which is by Extra Credits, that talks about how game companies can start um, screening people for, for uh, online game communities. But the thing is, is that fundamentally they are an employee of the company. Their goal is to regulate, police, maintain the rules and the codes of conduct that's created by the, um, by the company. But on the other hand, they also have to create, uh, their job is to maintain the community side of things, to make sure that it is a safe space, that, and a, a space that players want to engage in and, and continue to play. And without the instrumentalist aspect that Torsten was mentioning, you know, it's not just about making sure people keep pay, playing to keep paying, but it's that you want people to um, have this community. Um, and on that note, I will let Roland talk about community management a bit more. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Ah, perfect. So, first thing I have to do is I want to ask you, who of you is working as a community manager or social media manager? So, arms up. Okay, we can go. <laughs> we are finished now. So, um, I'm in the board of the Association for German Community Managers, and we are doing a little bit of providing the um, necessary list. Or, no, we are going to, to, to show how these uh, new um, jobs have to be defined and what kind of work um, there has to be included. So. Let's start. I, I manage my speech with some hashtags. It may be 100 or so. And I start with community management. And when we talk about community management in the business context, it's often an idea of doing marketing. We heard it from Thorsten already. So um, the idea we send information to the crowd is, is established in community, or is, is already today used by companies in the idea of doing community management. And there's no idea that community management is a better way to get in contact with people. And that brings me to my next hashtag. Who thinks community management is easy? <laughs> it's easy, or? <laughs> so, um, it's easy to create a fantastic community if you have a good product or a good idea or a good service, so they come to you just right now. But it isn't easy if your company doesn't fit to a system of ethics and values that is respected by your, uh, in, the, in the area you are working at. So I have an idea about community management, what I describe as a good neighborhood. So. Um, it's not a place where you put your marketing blah blah. If you, you visit American cities, there are parts which are really nice with English um, rasen um, <laughs> um, and other places with lots of um, graffiti. So what's the difference in this separate communities in a, in a bigger city? So and that's the situation we have on the internet. We have places with well, gardening, and we have places with the ugly face of communication we, we talk about today. So um, we are talking a lot about it at the uh, Republica. And why is it so? What, what can we do as a community manager to, to watch out that we not get this hate speech so visible? And. I'm sorry. So, we can do it with law. And we have to 
do law. Who of you has um, an etiquette or rules of engagement by managing your community? Okay, it's an accepted uh, method to organize the social work together. So um, I think law is an interesting point, and uh, when we um, talk about it in our association, it's really one of these things we need to do to handle in a way that other, way other people understand. And um, we have a problem because of we, and on the one side we do the legislative with creating law, and the other side we have to be the executive by prisoning people or put them out of our community. So it's a little bit different because of in our social society we have that in different um, positions. And that's one of the points we have problems with. And you see it at, to, at the moment at the discussion that Facebook is creating why our, our um, state is going to Facebook and says, hey, don't uh, um, provide this hate speech so much. So it's a little bit difficult. Why has the infrastructure to do this job? I don't believe that's the work of infrastructure um, delivery. So it's more the job of community managers. And we have to accept that companies, they create communities at these platforms, have to have a look on it. And they have to accept border crossing is one of these themes that our community not only is on one platform. So we have communities moving over different platforms and um, if this happened, we have to use different tools on different platforms. So that means a new mindset which accepts that we don't have tools like executives have to manage these negative um, voices. And I'm sorry, I need my text. <laughs> so to do this, we have to do an investment. Companies don't like this because of investment is not the idea of business because of we are really um, like more earning money. So the investment is in education. and. Um, Every one of you who's working at the job, I do it that since more than 10 years. And in the beginning, there was no one who can uh, talk about positive things or, or something he, he did before. So we have to try out everything our, by ourselves. That's not the situation now. We have really well-known experts in this area. We have in the, uh, at the universities so much content about this, so much practical background on this, so much studies about this, so that we are in a, in a world with full of information. So it must be easy for each of you to manage this negative, uh, 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 manage <laughs> these negative things in the communities. And one um, really hard fact that this could work is connect your community to the offline world. You have to meet your influencers live, maybe here at the Republica, so um, that you can get a better contact to your community. And if you, all, you, you know all your influencers in your community, it is easy, to you, or easy for you to identify each person who is doing wrong things in your community. You can contact him too in two or three ways and solve your problem without being doing it in the public. So that is one of the, the ideas we have um, by using offline in the online world. In the end, and that's uh, the last point of me, we have to talk about a culture of, of online, being online in communities that um, is nearby the culture we do it in the real life. And we have to accept there are rules and there are places where I can do things and other places where I don't have to do it. And this culture, we have to transport and we make it more um, the same. So I hope each of your professionals is doing this already. So, and now I'm finished and would like to send you to Nele. <laughs> scale, thank you. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Roland. Um, I said it before in the introduction, I'm a digital media researcher and interested in digital media ethics. So I want to talk a bit more about the problem of scale when we talk about online communities. 
because what we do online is communicate in the end, yeah, and your communities, uh, they are glued together by communication or miscommunication <laughs> in many cases. So maybe to come back or step uh, back a little bit uh, to the question what actually, uh, what ethics are, why we need them or why we need to discuss them. Um, I really like this uh, quote from 1978, so it's quite old, but I think it still applies. It's really simple. It says that ethics are guidelines and principles that help us to uphold our values and they are not simply prohibitions but they also support us in our positive responsibilities and i want to um, emphasize this responsibility aspect i think this is what all of you mentioned already so who is responsible uh, is it the managers uh, of the communities or is it the companies or the providers of communication platforms and so on but as I said, I'm more interested in uh, digital media communication, so we could think about uh, online communication ethics. So there are some uh, scholars uh, trying to set out some principles uh, of online communication, and they refer, of course, to basic and universal uh, human rights, human dignity, uh, harbor mass, discourse, ethics, and so on. I, I think this is a bit too much here. <laughs> but I just want to point out some of these principles are like uh, things like mutual respect in communication, uh, being authentic or selectively authentic, that our communication is uh, mutual, yeah? that uh, not one is speaking and the other one is not answering. Answering. And I, th I think this is really relevant if you think about community management. But also, and this is uh, really important for me, the idea of person, yeah, to accept others as persons, uh, to give them respect as persons, but also not to instrumentalize them. So if you think about money only when it comes to community management, yeah, this is, I would say this is instrumentalization by the people you are interacting with. Um, Many of you are familiar with these things, I guess, because they are also the foundation of netiquettes, guidelines, etc. Especially in forums, think of the beginning of the internet, then we had chatiquette and so on. So um, we have some frameworks and guidelines already at play in many, um, many uh, communication spaces we are now interacting with. However, uh, the communication environments we are, in, we are living in practically <laughs> uh, uh, as uh, heavy online users, you might be familiar with living in these media, they are large at scale. Think of Facebook, over 1.5 billion users. Think of uh, YouTube, over, those are numbers by them, I, <laughs> I didn't check, <laughs> I didn't count everyone. And then uh, even Twitter has uh, 300 to 320 million users. So we are in large scale communication environments. And also as uh, Roland already said, those platforms and environments are intersecting. Yeah, people are moving from Facebook to Twitter to YouTube and um, at a large scale. So uh, this leads, in my opinion, to some kind of context collapse. Yeah, because um, you never know who are these people. <laughs> yeah, this is from community. You as community manager should be familiar with this series. <laughs> So the question is, um, I cannot know, I mean, this is the idea of community management, to know most of your users, how they are, how they communicate, what they want or what they don't want. But in large-scale environments, this is absolutely impossible. And I think we have a lack of context. Uh, we, those platforms uh, have global reach. Um, you can have anonymous profiles, there's a lack of social cues, there's also, I think, some communicative distance to most of those users, so, and this is why these comment sections go wild all the time. This is, I'd say, is one of, part of the problem. Um, and this is different because if we stand here and sit here together, this is face-to-face -face communication. So we have an idea uh, that this context of our interaction um, shapes to some extent how we will act and what we will say so we can adjust our tone or maybe uh, change the way we present ourselves. So on social media you could say that 
parts of that are cut off or maybe removed or maybe more difficult. Yeah? Maybe to see the expressions of those who, who, with whom we are communicating. Just one example. And Warwick, Marwick and Boyd, they call this uh, context collapse uh, through social media technologies. And there's another problem. It's not only the context uh, which vanishes or which is harder to define or harder to grasp. It's also that we face multiple audiences on social media platforms. Yeah, you have uh, on Twitter, you have uh, people from the US having their own hashtags or you have communities uh, from New Zealand some, or from Germany or whatsoever, so we have not only different languages but also different cultures involved on these platforms. And I think this makes it really hard to apply some of those ethical principles uh, I mentioned before. When it comes to scale, there's also another problem. This is uh, Mark Burroughs. He was a, a former moderator of, Guardian, uh, of the Guardian community. And he pointed out that scale matters in, a, uh, in, another, um, in another way. He says that the worst experiences he had, he, he left The Guardian, so he could write about this on The Guardian platform. The worst experiences he had uh, was uh, oh, the, um, below the line uh, involved large-scale assaults by groups of people who wanted to ruin the community conversation, um, either through a convergence of like-minded people, so people decide, oh, we have the same opinion, yeah, let's uh, crash, this, uh, crash this conversation, or by organizations. So he calls them ag agenda trolls, and their, their idea is uh, not to discuss, but to ruin the conversation, and which is basically really unethical behavior. And the problem here is you don't have like 100 uh, hundreds of people, but um, thousands of people who are doing this together. So this is uh, what I mean with the question of scale and uh, how we work or how we uphold our ethical principles and communication principles in a large-scale environment. And uh, there's another thing, <laughs> I think, which is really a, a problem nowadays when we talk about online conversations and comment sections, etc. It's uh, social bots. So we don't even know if we're talking about two human beings anymore. <laughs> and what's even worse, we also instrumentalize those bots. So Tai is an excellent example. She was uh, taught to, to misbehave. Yeah? And we could also think about um, ethical principles, uh, not only if we talk to humans, but also with bots. And we, we, have, we don't have any idea for that yes, uh, yet, I would suggest. And we should uh, start thinking about this. So to come back to Mark Burroughs, he's actually an optimist. Yeah? He's seen really awful stuff, I'd say, but he's an optimist. He believes that we can change the conversation and that we can become better by actually changing behavior that does not only involve the Guardian itself, but also to respect the commenters and also respect the fact that uh, harmful behavior causes pain in people, yeah? to realize that people are involved. And uh, one of my questions or two questions I have is how can we create actually or promote and actually design a healthy environment or healthy communicative cultures and how can we assure that they are based on shared norms and values, so not top-down, but that we negotiate um, these aspects. And then the question of how to implement those universal rights and principles into those large-scale global communication environments. So um, will we shape it, the future of online conversation, or will it be shaped for us, and what is our role? Um, this was my short input, and uh, thank you. So, um, now it's uh, my turn to be the moderator. <laughs> if you want to, you can come uh, more with your, with your so chairs, more to? in the center. Oh, come on, yes. Okay. You're not being filmed. 
or being difficult. <laughs> All right. Yeah, business doc says ethics are important. So we have dog. plenty of time, actually, like tw 20 minutes That's now. So um, and we would, first of all, would like to hear your opinions and also maybe your questions, uh, as we have many community managers here in the room. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. There's a microphone over there. And um, yeah, if nobody wants to ask something, we're also discussing a bit about it. <laughs> Give them time to run away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as you can see, we also have dogs in our slides, not only kittens. So it's, it's a fair share here. <laughs> Hello, I have a question. <laughs> but I think all of you are more cat okay. people on this stage. I yes. think here's the one first question. Yeah. So maybe I hand over. Hello, thank you. My name is Maike Richter and I work for uh, Norddeutscher Rundfunk uh, as a social media manager and uh, strategist. So thanks for this talk. Uh, I learned a lot, but I have one, um, excuse my poor English, like one remark. You talk about trolls and I think it's important that we distinguish between trolls and haters. Mm -hmm. So because trolls are very annoying, they destroy communication. Um, they can kill online com communities, but haters, that is something different. You know, that are people who post a lot of folks for heads and the uh, mm -hmm. stuff. I don't know the English uh, translation. And they really hate, they are threatening people. And I think it's very important to distinguish between trolls and haters. So that's just my remark for your talk. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, actually, because uh, we did not include it in our times, but yeah, we share, we share this, uh, uh, this impression that it's really important not only to separate between different uh, uh, harmful online behaviors, yeah, because there's a multiplicity of, of the things you can think of, from trolling to uh, cyberbullying, stalking, and so on. Yeah, but uh, thanks for this point, yeah. I think this is uh, also, um, yeah, this is kind of part of conversation. Right, Do yeah, first of all, it's, hi, Maike. I, uh, <laughs> 10 years ago, I cited your master's thesis in my master's thesis, so hi. Uh, uh, wow, you um, <laughs> know your was, community. <laughs> that was a long time ago, but uh, I want Pardon? I wrote my master thesis about open source. Right, exactly, exactly. Oh. That's where I come from. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay. coffee after. It was like my point is the world is small. <laughs> Just proving the the value of community. Um, also, sorry for actually not ever saying this before. Um, the point though is you you may, you raise a great point that in like constitutional law we sort of cover right by giving people fundamental rights like human rights and all that kind of stuff right that you are never and under no circumstance allowed to be to mess with. Right? But then there's also sort of additional contractual obligations that we have as people between people, right? Bürgerliches um, Recht, right? It's between citizens, right? We regulate how we as citizens are allowed to interact with one another. Um, and yes, there's a lot of research sort of coming out since like 2000, I don't know, 12 maybe, on sort of like constitutional rights in digital context, right? Like on sort of having a digital constitution for certain communities and all kinds of stuff. Um, and those conversations, I think like Kelly Parley knows more about because it's often that online games have sort of pioneered this already, right? Because you had online games way back when, and I think Raf Koster is the guy who wrote about this, right? Um, in like 2002 already, where the question is, if you run an online game community like Ultima Online or whatever in like the good old days, um, are your players just consumers or are your players citizens of this online space and do they have mm -hmm. to, the right to actually have a say in conversations, right? And those, those were times where it was all just like sort of people messing with each other, right? like stealing digital stuff or whatever kind of thing, right? Like it wasn't really the kind of real drama we've been seeing these past two, three years where, where the stuff that you talked about actually um, hit the fan really badly. Um, so I think like that kind of stuff, though, is actually covered by real world law in real world uh, textbooks and cases and all that kind of stuff. And I think it's, it's very important to address those kinds of harassment as actual legal matters, not just being nice to a community, right? So you need to be, be serious about sort of foundation, the foundation of um, like actual human rights. And then there's sort of like levels of politeness and all kinds of stuff that we can discuss when it comes to community management, right? But everybody needs to be on the same page when it comes to human rights and those kinds of things, right? 
for me? There's some at the back. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. I'm going to shut up now. I think here are more questions. I... Yeah. Hi. Peter, I'm building a music community, and I was curious if you've seen any developments around chatbots as mediators in community management. Is, is there anything happening there and anything working? This is the, the tool solution, the technology solution then. Um, actually, I'm, I'm not so much into that, but of course it's part of what we would say, is it a top-down approach then? To yeah, um, I haven't seen it in the online gaming community specifically, um, but it would be a top-down in the sense that it still has to be programmed by the dev community or whatever community uh, is managing. So unless it's... <laughs> Unless it's open, um, opening a conversation with the community, I think that that's... Uh, it, the example with the Microsoft bot is a bit of a dangerous kind of warning sign. So, I'm, yeah, I'll just <laughs> leave it at that. Yeah, that gives you, like, I'm, I'm no expert on this, obviously, because I'm no expert on anything. But the point is you have two ways of dealing with this, right? Either you program a fixed algorithm or whatever kind of thing to to then top down regulate right like then you the company come up with like the 10 commandments pretty literally and say here's the bot that's going to now interact with the community and just execute what we have decided is like okay behavior right and just like kill all behavior that's not been defined by us as acceptable so that's not great the other thing then is the tay thing right like if you actually allow the bot to learn yeah, that can go to, like, to, like, straight to hell real fast. Um, oh, so I, I, I feel like this is a thing where you're doomed either way. So I actually think it's a smarter move to trust people in making those calls and not just try to have smart people program something to be even smarter than people. That just regularly mm. fails. Uh, actually, and you said technology is not, never neutral. So I mean, yeah. a technologist or uh, the functional solution, I think there's also the danger to um, yeah, to miss the whole point of community management at all is getting to know the motives of people who are violating or who are doing, uh, who are, uh, doing harmful behavior. So there is this chance to get on conversation. You know, um, two years ago or so, I was involved in a larger research project. We uh, did case studies at Tagesschau, Süddeutsche Zeitung, the Freitag, and a political talk show. Um, at this Aster, <laughs> I won't say the name, <laughs> anonymous. Um, and what we saw there, that users actually liked uh, the community spaces those, uh, uh, those media organizations created for themselves much better than Facebook or YouTube or Twitter. So the wild comment sections or those wild communities out there on Twitter. So they were, um, they, yeah, they were saying like, no, I don't want to discuss there. And they really appreciated the fact that there were community managers and, and sometimes even, uh, even journalists involved in the comment sections. Yeah, and uh, many journalists told us, yeah, if we get involved in, uh, in I don't know, heated uh, discussions and debates, we can see how the tone gets adjusted. Yeah, this was the idea of a context and how to create this context. So um, I just heard that there are some media companies with huge forums on their websites who will never take a look at the forums anymore. So they gave up on their own website, in, the own, in this very space, they can define and also do something about this. Yeah? This is also a problem of having control over online environments, and, um, which is limited uh, in many things, like uh, if you think about first Facebook and what they might change, or, or Twitter or so. So I would say, or I would agree with Mark, he says we can't give up. We need to de ways to design conversations in a, to, yeah, to give them a constructive direction. But that would mean that everybody involved in a media organization um, would also have a say, would also have uh, to acknowledge the fact that there's a community out there that they're not, not just sending out anything, uh, everything anymore, but there is a feedback channel and to, uh, yeah, to put some value on it and not saying like, this is our crap corner or 
This is like uh, the bad neighborhood on our own website. So because bad comments and bad de uh, or uh, yeah, destructive uh, conversation, they have a negative influence on your content. So just to, to kind of come back to the question, though, I, I think you should have to ask yourself. <laughs> no, I mean, it's someone has but to, to ask yourself. <laughs> Um, what is the goal of, of the monitoring? Are you just trying to regulate behavior? Um, so as Torsten said, very top down, or are you trying to foster a community? Uh, and if you're developing a music website, chances are you probably want to foster a community and people are, tend to be the best at doing that. So hmm. there was a question. No? Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Frank. I have a question to another phenomenon that relates to like saying, that lots of people weren't like eager to actually do anything. And now I see a school of social media community management that actually goes into the opposite direction, that doesn't go for actually clarifying or uh, mediating, but they go straight for the punchline. They actually go in there and say, hey, you, you look stupid, fuck up. And they actually kind of have success with that because they get engagement on these comments, they get like second-hand um, reporting on that. And what do you think about that? I have a strong opinion about it. It's crap. It's really disrespectful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would have used this as, uh, as an example, but it's uh, nice that you bring it up. Yeah, actually, if you talk about ethical principles like personhood or res mutual respect, if you go to your, uh, I think you talk about Facebook, yeah? so social media managers on Facebook uh, making fun of uh, commenters and so on. Yeah, if, if you want to do this, this is really destructive. It's um, shaming of people. It doesn't matter how bad they were. Maybe they had a bad day or whatsoever. They were really awful. But this is your, you have to uh, change the conversation and not put another, um, yeah, put another, how, how is it called? Uh, heating it up. Uh, the, the through the fire. these things. Yeah. yeah, so I would really say this is also instrumentalizing people because you want to make a point, uh, the point of being, I'm sitting here for eight hours and uh, I have enough of you. I will write something really funny now and then please shut up, yeah? And others will like that, yeah? This is also about uh, attracting attention or I don't know, click rates and all of this. And I think it's instru instrumentalizing yeah. because you use that user in the case to make this point and you embarrass him, and I don't think that this will be successful at all in the long, on the long run. Yeah. So there are um, different education we, we are doing as society at the moment. So uh, we see that there are cases like Bundesregierung, which um, uh, use a fine sin of humor to uh, interact with these people that works pretty good and it's always uh, eye to eye, it's not getting you down. So mm. this is a good case if you go in the aggressive kind of, of getting people down. I don't believe that would work for a longer time because of you um, create something like a war of words and um, the weapons get bigger but you don't solve the problem. So. I believe we have to educate each other, not only the professionals, the audience too, so um, that you have self-healing effects in your community in the end. You see it like Telekom Hilft, there are uh, guys from the community which are answering to the uh, other guys from the community and the community management just have to, to have fingers on it. So that are cases where community management is on a higher level and I believe that must be our target to, to educate all the people in the internet to accept that there are rules for communication. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, can, I, can I add yeah, no, a gaming a thing? There's some more? Oh, sorry. Hey, just a second. <laughs> I will try to be short. I know I, I, I will fail at that. But the point is, um, I think that the, the thing that you bring up actually raises 
the point of there having to be consequences for misbehavior, right? Like that's the thing that, that gets praised in these contexts, right? And there's a, a teeny tiny game called League of Legends that people play online, only just like 60 million of them. It's an incredibly competitive game and that is why it's incredibly toxic, right? But they employ a whole bunch of psychologists to study why their players are toxic. And one of the things they found out is the reason a lot of their players are toxic is not because they're anonymous or anything, it's because there are no consequences for saying the N-word or those kinds of things, right? And then they sort of messed around with it and ran a whole bunch of ethically questionable experiments on their own user base um, where they found out if you just like show a pop-up window even that says you just used an unacceptable word, then all of a sudden like the player gets sort of like taken aback, right, and realizes, oh, there actually is a rule here that I was not aware of in like the heat of the game, right? Um, and that way you can educate users, right? But that means you have to take them seriously in the first place and not like shoot back or punch back with like the same kind of vigor that the, the infraction was in the first place. Right? Take seriously things are happening there and that virtual worlds can cause harm to people. So right. this I would also add your hat Kant on your slides. <laughs> and uh, was he the inventor of this golden rule? Like, no, uh, no, 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 no. The golden rule is like an old-timey and also really <laughs> shitty thing. But like the idea is like take people seriously as as people with dignity, yeah, right? Like, and also the yeah. idea I think would be so uh, do no things that you don't want to be uh, experienced yourself. So I mean this also counts for community managers mm. I think. Mm. So if you don't want to be screamed at by, by sometime, or someone or um, you don't want to be made fun of in public on a public space, so just don't do it. Right. Okay, one last question. Yeah, no, th the only thing I wanted to say is that uh, talking about communities, we're not only talking about haters and trolls, but there are positive effects as well mm. oh, that absolutely. we forget. So. Um, <laughs> And whenever we communicate as social media managers or something, um, the communication doesn't end at the screen. There is a person, and this person might take this with into her or his real life. So if we are rude to someone, he takes it out. He's, it's not, uh, it doesn't end at the computer screen. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really have to uh, make sure that we don't think of a community as a bunch of people with no names, but of human beings, single human beings who we affect, mm -hmm. and they affect us as well. We, we just, there are weeks we go home and we're really pissed off <laughs> with the community and we really don't want to talk to any of them again. But again, what affects us does affect them. So we can do we can handle this in a positive way um, by um, giving positive voices yeah. a, a chance to be heard. So we just click a like on their comments. So it's another ki kind of interaction, not only um, regulating hate speech or trolls, but giving those who have a positive opinion a voice by making them visible. And we can do this with a like or with another comment saying, thank you for this comment. It's just, uh, it's a little thing to do but it can uh, change the, the, uh, the way the conversation is um, being seen. Yeah, I just want to kind of uh, add to that. Um, I've been reading a lot about uh, kind of toxic uh, messages on Facebook and whatnot, and uh, around the community of mummy blogs, uh, parents who blog about their raising their children, and some of the very, very, it's actually a very toxic community where parents like to judge and say very mean things to other mothers uh, about how horrible they're doing their job. And I was reading this one article uh, about this woman who was torn apart in the comment section on her blog and they said that she was a horrible mother and she should have her children taken away and she was seething and she really wanted to basically lash out and she slept on it uh, and wrote the next day and kind of wrote a positive message to this woman saying, you know, it sounds like you're doing the best you can do as a mom yourself and I know how hard it is. And she actually responded in kindness to a very toxic um, mm -hmm. response of which the, the woman who originally wrote the negative comment had a moment of self-reflection and actually apologized on her board, on her message saying, um, oh my God, I'm so sorry, you're raising three children, it can't be easy, and I just, ah, I was having a day. And so instead of her like, taking that moment and not lashing out, it changed the conversation, it changed the tone, and it actually probably strengthened that, um, that, that mummy blog community, so.
Yes. He manages as well. Yes. Take your time. Yes, don't absolutely. just respond, don't react, but take your time, think about it, and then write something that's not emotional, but give facts, yeah. for instance. And also invite people to be part of the conversation. Yeah, we talk uh, to, uh, or, yeah, barely no times we talk about how we want to build our communication in certain communities. So I think um, this is uh, our time to start the conversation, but we hope you will continue the conversation in your communities and let's get ethical. Thank you and Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you guys for the very insightful talks and thoughts about how it's be to be a community manager and all these challenges. Thank you. We'll be back in 15 minutes here on stage six. See you again. Thank <laughs> you.